Hey guys, I am so excited to announce that the movie that you've been waiting for, the documentary Dr. Patient, is now available for rent or purchase at drpatientmovie.com. Check out the trailer here. When I really knew something was wrong was when I started having trouble walking up the stairs. I was supposed to be grateful and happy and healing and well and thriving, but I did not feel that way. I was so sick. Like always, I wanted to find an answer and I had to figure it out, and I had to figure it out to save my own life. So I dove in. Jill is the leading voice in biotoxin illness and chronic conditions that are driven by toxicity. Oh my gosh, you're dealing with mold? You have to work with Dr. Jill Carnahan. Dr. Jill was the first person that actually began to shed some light on the problem. What I do is listen to the patient and we together talk about what else is possible. I don't know why I'm crying. <laughs> she saved my life. The deepest lessons and most profound insights come in the suffering, come in the dark moments. Self-compassion is the healing transition that, that shifts something inside of us. It's actually the thing that we need most in order to heal. Dr. Patient. Available now at drpatientmovie.com. Welcome to Resiliency Radio, your go-to podcast for the most cutting-edge insights in functional and integrative medicine. I'm your host, Dr. Jill, and each episode we dive into the heart of healing and personal transformation. Join us as we connect with renowned experts, thought leaders, innovators, and all those who are at the forefront of transforming medical research and clinical practice. Today, I want to empower you with knowledge and information to help transform you in your health journey, inspiring you to hope and healing and new horizons. Uh, hey guys, if you haven't heard, my movie Dr. Patient is out. It's at drpatientmovie.com. You can rent it, buy it, share it, um, gift it to a friend. I am hoping, um, like many of you we've heard from, that it is inspiring and impacting you in your journey, whether you're a patient or you're a practitioner. But please do share the word. And if you haven't watched it, go take a look and then let me know what you think. Today, I am so excited to have my friend and colleague and uh, local expert here, uh, Dr. Mazula. He is board certified in both family medicine and sports medicine. He's also certified in musculoskeletal ultrasound since 2013. He currently practices as a non-operative regenerative orthopedist at Breakthrough Regenerative Orthopedics in Boulder, Colorado. He previously served as team physician at the U.S. Air Force Academy. He's passionate about teaching. Uh, he's affiliated with the University of Colorado Medical School and completed two SI ligament, that's sacroiliac ligament studies at the Rocky Vista University College of Osteopathic Medicine. He's taught advanced ultrasound guided techniques in regenerative medicine procedures and uh, in this textbook titled Regenerative Treatments in Sports and Orthopedic Medicine. He's also co-authored a recent review paper on optimizing PRP doses and formulation with Peter Everts and others. And I am just so excited to have you here, Dr. Mazula, because so much of what we do intersects. And we had a great conversation a few days ago about this, but welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Jill. It really is an honor to be here. And thanks for all your passion, your energy, and your yeah, your efforts to get the good word out. So I appreciate how you are transforming healthcare and that's my goal as well. So yeah, I'm just- We so all need each other, don't we? And I just love just <laughs> recently, we had this really long, we were saying how the time flew by in this conversation and we've known each other, like seen each other in social situations, but it was just like really understanding we both are so similar as far as how we want to do medicine and treat patients and Let's start with your journey, though. I love the story behind the story. Tell us, how did you get into medicine? And then how did you get into sports medicine and what you're currently doing? Sure thing. Yeah, so, uh, you know, it's a, it is a, it's kind of an ironic story that when I was a younger kid, my mom's best friend was a nurse, and she was always excited in our family because we had five of us, and she knew that she one of us was going to be a doctor. And she pegged me. And so, but me, of course, I didn't want anything to do with it. I wanted to know that that kind of responsibility seemed foreign to me. And I really wanted to be surfing, riding my bike, doing all the fun things in life with very little responsibility. 
And uh, so I went my way through through university down at UC San Diego, living on the beach, riding my bike up and down the coast, playing beach volleyball and surfing as much as I could. And uh, I wasn't taking school very seriously because I thought I was going to be an engineer. I had two brothers that were already in the field, two uncles that were in the field. So that was my path. And it was just kind of easy going. And that all changed when I got into upper division engineering and realized that I couldn't pass those classes. It was the first time I'd ever gotten an F in my life. And that was in the basic introductory upper division uh, engineering classes. So like I could not get through. And so I'm like, hmm, what does this mean? So I went on a bit of a journey and trying to understand that, took a semester off, went to Steamboat Springs, Colorado for the winter, became a ski bum and thought about it. And when I came back, it was the spring of 20, I mean, excuse me, 19, gosh, that was back in the day, 1986, 87. And my best friend passed away suddenly and unexpectedly of a ruptured berry aneurysm in his brain. And that got me thinking because up until that point, I really didn't have a plan for my life. I didn't really think much about where I was going other than just to be an engineer. And that was, that door was closing. So um, after Mark passed, it just became one of my efforts was to, I guess, keep him alive in my life was to take on some of his characteristics. And the things that I wasn't doing at the time was I wasn't really thinking much about what to do with my life and who do I really want to spend my time with and how do I want to uh, make an impact. And he was doing all of those things. And so I, I with the tragic loss of Mark in and because it was medical, somehow it stimulated this thinking in my mind. And so I was still trying to kind of avoid medicine as much as possible. I tried PT and I tried doing research on the bench and all these other things, but none of them really seemed to match up with what was inside of me and something was stirring. And um, even though I knew nothing about medicine and I only had one person in my family who had done it, uh, I started studying for the medical, the, med the MCATs, right? Yeah. <laughs> the yeah. next thing I knew. And it's a funny story because I did get accepted to medical school eventually. And, and um, the irony is, Jill, that I really never even spent a day doing a clinical rotation shadowing another uh -huh. physician. I didn't know what I was getting into. And so, you know, it all moved on and, and I got the Air Force scholarship. That's how I ended up in the Air Force. Um, and that was kind of my hedge because like, well, if I don't like medicine, I only have to work four years and I uh -huh. can always go and do something else because I was non-committal, if you can probably tell by the conversation. I wasn't very committal, but um, I was getting more committal and some things happened in my life and, and things changed. And as I was driving cross country to go to Hershey, Pennsylvania from Southern California, mind you, all the things that I was good at, like surfing and beach volleyball really meant nothing to people in central Pennsylvania. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> as I was driving across the country after about three days, I, I was kind of wrestling with God. And it was, it was what really I think was going on was I was resisting. And, and I felt like here I was going across the country to do the hardest thing I'd ever done with nobody that I knew and all the things I was good at didn't mean anything. So I was really just kind of down yeah. to nothing. And in the end, about the best I could come up with is, okay, I'll let you help me. Oh. And so I was definitely famous uh, last words to God, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You open that door, you never know where you're going to end up. And, uh, and so it was a number of maybe about eight more years before, I guess I would say I actually kind of developed a true faith. Um, but that I think has made the difference for me and my journey and my pathway um, and, and definitely empowered a lot of my passion and inspiration for what I do and how I do it these days. So um, that's how I got into medicine. And then when I was at medical school, I was really thinking, you know, I was always an athlete. And so I was thinking, okay, do I want to do orthopedics? But I, the one doctor I did know was my family doctor. So I thought, well, maybe I'll be a family doctor. And so I was comparing those two rather different professions. And when I got into my clinical rotations, the first thing I had was orthopedic surgery. And spending my first day or two in the operating room was enough for me to realize that that was just way too violent and too intense. Yeah. And the attitudes uh, and the egos, they were just too much for me. And so I spent a little more time meeting with the family physicians and they were just these wonderful human beings balanced. And so I went that path. I became a family physician. And to my great surprise, when I was in one of my clinical rotations uh, about Two years later, I, I learned that there was such a thing as sports medicine, 
that you could do as a non-surgeon related to family medicine. And it was like, I knew instantly that's what I would be doing. So that's how I got into family medicine and then eventually into sports medicine. And um, yeah, I think, you know, the rest kind of has been history. Wow. I just love, there's some really neat things that are similar that we didn't know. And I'm just listening. Number one, I was bioengineering undergrad and I remember the physics engineering and up until then I could just study and learn and do anything I wanted to do. Right. And I'll never forget mm -hmm. like, oh, this might be above me. Like it was so hard and it was my first mm -hmm. like a less than an A, a grade, you know? And I was like, oh, I just remember that engineering school of medicine, you know, it was engineering in University of Illinois and that same exact thought of like, oh, maybe this isn't for me. And yeah. then the same thing is like, there's been no medical doctors in my family at all. So I had no role models and I never really hardly even thought I could become a doctor. So it was such a strange, as I'm hearing you talk, I can relate on so many levels. Mm -hmm. Then the same thing in- medicine, there is hierarchical kind of like when you go into family medicine, it's like, well, why are you going into family medicine? But the truth is like, I'm just going to be a little bit, um, maybe some stereotypes here, but the genuine people who really, really want to help go into primary care, usually mm -hmm. uh, I shouldn't say this as a general, because there's so many great, amazing surgeons, but there is a, there's a whole different, there's a whole different mentality <laughs> in the surgical yeah. realms, right? There's like a yeah, different personalities, and, right? <laughs> For sure. Well, I can relate to that too, because I ended up family medicine. And uh, and I remember in Chicago, everybody's like, what? You're doing family medicine? But yeah. I have no regrets, right? That's amazing. I'm going yeah, to find sports medicine. So then, um, I mean, what's really neat is um, you're very humble, but what you're doing in clinical practice is really cutting edge. And as we even got to know each other better recently in our conversation, you've been doing some of this stuff for as long as almost anyone out there. How did you get to be one of the, you know, cutting edge in regenerative medicine? What does that mean to those listening who maybe don't know? Um, and, and just tell us a little bit about that, like diving into the depths of, of this new kinds of ways to treat injuries. Yeah. Yeah. That's, a, that is, a, it's quite a journey in and of itself. And it's a great question. So thanks for that one. Um, yeah, I think what happened was. In sports medicine, historically, we are trained by surgeons how to think orthopedically. And generally what that means is if you have a soft tissue injury, if, if, it, if it is uh, mild enough that it doesn't need surgery or there isn't an appropriate surgery for it, then it just goes to physical therapy and maybe you take some anti-inflammatory medication or get a steroid shot. And if it doesn't get better, well, that's just too bad. Uh, if it's if it's a surgical problem, we're trained to understand what is likely surgical, and then let's put them down that pathway. And what I realize is that the difference between physical therapy and surgery is a is a fairly large gap, actually. And Motrin and steroid shots really don't fix anything. <laughs> so, right. right. So uh, it it became it was just very fortuitous for the timing. To answer your question about the timing, it was very fortuitous because. Here I was, uh, sports medicine trained, and in 2007, at one of our annual sports medicine society meetings, there were a couple speakers that got up and taught about musculoskeletal ultrasound and its applications in orthopedics, and just took the whole conference by storm. Everyone had their eyes open. We were all super excited, and some people jumped on it and some people waited. I was one of the people that jumped on it. So there's another, there is a, an incredible miraculous story in how I got my ultrasound machine if we had the time. But uh, I eventually got my ultrasound machine in 2007. We were down in Pagosa Springs, so rather rural. Yeah. Uh, at the time I was trying to live the mountain lifestyle, trying to be able to ski as much as possible without having to drive I-70. Anyone in the front range knows what I'm talking about. Yes. <laughs> and, and it worked for a while actually, but um, they developed a, a critical access hospital down there and there weren't enough physicians in town to man it all. And I was literally on, on a path to my demise <laughs> because of the hours and the, the lack of sleep and nutrition and exercise. There's, I was losing my life. And so we had to move, but um, but I did get my ultrasound machine while I was there. And it was interesting because that's what helped me get my job working in orthopedic surgical practice in the front range eventually was the thing that differentiated me was that I had an ultrasound yeah. machine and knew how to use it. Yeah. So there was some value there. And the thing that I, I noticed when I, when I joined this orthopedic surgical practice in 2009, that would have been, was that I could, I could do a blind steroid 
a shot for say subacromial bursitis or rotator cuff tendinopathy. And I could do an ultrasound guided injection with steroid perfectly into the bursa and I would get no difference in outcome. It was exactly wow. the same. So like, what was the value of a $40,000 ultrasound machine and a, and a person who knows how to use it? Yeah. If the thing inside the syringe just isn't changing anything and they're still stuck with, well, it's non-surgical, go back to the PT. Right. So that was unsatisfying for me. And at the same time, PRP, platelet-rich plasma, had just come on the scene like a year or two before people started talking about that. And I'd been reading about it, of course. And so then I thought, well, maybe if I could get that in the syringe and get it accurately placed, that could make a difference. And fortunately for me, the surgeons that I did work with were much more gentlemanly than the ones I trained with in medical school. And they said, go for it. And they gave me an opportunity. And um, so that really changed things. And then I started getting opportunities to treat patients that couldn't, that really weren't appropriate surgical candidates um, or they didn't want surgery because they just themselves preferred not to. And so I had an eight year period where I was just growing in my ability to diagnose with an ultrasound, treat with ultrasound guided injections, mostly with PRP, sometimes stem cells occasionally. Um, there was a, you know, there's been so many steps along the way, it's kind of hard to lay it all out, but we really started with tendons. Yeah. That's where the data was. Mm -hmm. And then a few years later, we started getting the research on osteoarthritis. And so then that kind of really developed. Now there was a broad range of things that we could be treating. And then I also learned that we could treat ligaments yeah. and we could hydro dissect around nerves by putting wow. fluid around them to free up nerves that were entrapped without surgery. And oh my, what a difference maker that has been. So that's not even regenerative, yeah. uh, but it's, <laughs> but it's an amazing intervention that we can do with an ultrasound. So the, the difference, I think the thing that really changed for me was the ultrasound machine. And, and the miracle there was that really God bought that for me. <laughs> that was a, like, it's a true story. And, and yeah. uh, we can get to that when we're talking another time, but that's what really changed things. And that's what got me my job with the orthopedic group. And then I became an orthopedic specialist, yeah. right? Because I was no mm -hmm. longer a family doctor. Now mm -hmm. they told me, they're like, no, you're a specialist now. Don't think like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> like you need to be a specialist. And that was a bit of a transition and it took a while, maybe a year or two for me to be comfortable with that notion. Um, but yeah, that was 2009. And here we are 15 years later. And the, the data has evolved, the, the anatomy that we can find with an ultrasound, uh, without having to open up a person's body to be able to intervene with an injury. And what's the, the real surprise in all of this is that if you learn how to do great physical examination from people that aren't surgeons, people that understand soft tissue injury, uh -huh then you can actually find injuries in the soft tissue that nobody heretofore has been able to find. And I think that's been maybe the biggest step up that has been made is in the diagnostic realm, not just of using the ultrasound to look at something, right. but how to put your hands on somebody and actually find areas of injury and weakness in the body, and then take your ultrasound and go and find it and prove it with an injection. And that's really been uh, that constellation of things, you know, being able to look in the body, intervene in the body, diagnose, and then good physical examination. And, and I'm telling you, like, it's just been amazing. The people that have been placed into my life, like it, it's everyone has come just at the right time. Yeah. And, um, and I've been just the beneficiary of so many, like standing on the shoulders of other giants who have taught me. And so now I get to teach others as well. And, and that's a joy. So. Hey, everybody. I just stopped by to let you know that my new book, Unexpected, Finding Resilience Through Functional Medicine, Science, and Faith is now available for order wherever you purchase books. In this book, I share my own journey of overcoming life-threatening illness and the tools and tips and tricks and hope and resilience I found along the way. This book includes practical advice for things like cancer and Crohn's disease and other autoimmune conditions, infections like Lyme or Epstein-Barr and mold and biotoxin-related illness. What I really hope is that as you read this book, you find transformational wisdom for health and healing. If you want to get your own copy, stop by readunexpected.com. There you can also collect your free bonuses. So grab your copy today and begin your own transformational journey through functional medicine in finding resilience. That is so amazing because here I am, I've been in medicine 20 plus years, and I don't think I even understood how powerful an ultrasound could be in diagnosis. 
And one yeah. thing that um, you and I are both passionate about teaching other physicians that are coming up in the ranks, and, and we can talk more about that and, and the conference you did last year and everything. I want to get there. But one thing that's really interesting is I think the physical exam, especially at the level and depth of understanding that you have is a lost art. I think so, so many, I so often hear a patient who's been to the ER and I'm like, did they touch your belly? You had belly pain and they didn't touch you. They didn't do an exam at all. And I'm literally like, really like this, it's hard to believe, but I think some of the students coming out have, and, and then of course, some of them trained during COVID when things were more virtual and they learned these virtual kinds of things. There's just nothing like laying the hands on a patient, right? And I think yeah. you and I understand too, even just that physical touch is part of the healing. Right. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that you're passionate about teaching this because I just feel like it's hard to find good teachers of the physical exam anymore. Yeah, that's exactly right. I am so passionate about that. And that's interestingly the hardest part to convey. Yeah. So it really takes a workshop. Right. You have to you have to have time with people where you can actually have a patient in front of you and then you can walk them through the physical examination because it's something that's never been taught. Yeah. Because we've, like I said, historically always been taught orthopedic examination by orthopedic surgeons. And what they're really looking for is like, is this surgical? Is this not? And that's very appropriate in their hands. What we're looking for is, can we treat this non-surgically or not? And, and what is the problem? Yeah. Like, what is the nature of reality? And if we can get to understanding, or at least as close as possible to what is actually the problem, then we can come up with rational treatment approaches for that, right? And I love how you said, yeah, I, I hear this all the time. I went, to this, I went to the orthopedic surgeon. He came in the room. He sat down for five minutes. He told me my MRI said I didn't need surgery. Yeah. And he said, I can't help you go back to PT. Or, or we looked at your MRI and it showed you had a labral tear. So therefore we can do surgery. Yeah. But no physical exam, right? Like just completely making decisions based on an imaging study that shows about like, what is the status of the hydrogen ion in that tissue? Yeah. And on an MRI, like six, probably 70% of the people over age 45 will have a labral tear on their hip MRI, but not 70% of the people that have a hip labral tear on an MRI need surgery. Right. You feel me? Right. So, so like you have to be able to discern and distinguish like, well, what is the root cause of that labral tear on an MRI? Like, is it a tear? Yeah. Is it maybe just a, a signal that's it's a volume averaging from something next door? Is it a cleft in the labrum? Is it an actual tear? Is it just degeneration? Is it a little too much pressure that the labrum is experiencing because maybe they have sacroiliac ligamentous laxity and then rotated pelvis. And then now the, if this is the femur and this is the acetabulum and this is the labrum right here, if you have a rotated pelvis, you can see how if you uh, go into hip flexion, you're going to compress the labrum, right? Yes. Whereas if you're not rotated, then it, you can clear easily. So if I can find that, oh, it's it's the rotation from the sacroiliac ligament laxity, then we don't even need to talk about your labrum because once we've stabilized your ligament posteriorly, there's no pain anteriorly. And that happens routinely. I mean, that's all amazing. I want to go into kind of a few patient examples and stuff, but before we do, I want to tell you a real quick story of, of uh, my end of one, which is me. And I think <laughs> you'll relate and you can certainly comment on it. Maybe 12, 15 years ago, when I moved to Colorado, I had just been in mold exposure. I was inflamed. I was, um, and I'll never forget one of the flights out here to look for housing and where was I going to work. And yeah, this was probably 2009, 2010. Um, I literally was in a wheelchair getting off and on the plane because I had such bad low back pain. I mean, mm -hmm. excruciating. I have a very high pain tolerance. Mm -hmm. I ended up getting the MRI and you can imagine there was severe degeneration, L4, L5, L5, S1. The height of the disc was like half. There was bone inflammation. There was like, and there was actually um, nerve impingement. I am not the expert on reading MRIs. So forgive yeah. my lay person's terms right. on it. Bottom line was like, it looked bad, right? And I was, mm. I was in my late thirties and all that to say, and I was in severe pain. What happened was why the functional medicine and what you do are so interlined because I had severe, severe mold toxicity, severe inflammation. My gut was inflamed as well, which hits on the psoas and the low back and mm -hmm. then um, stress because I was moving. So all of those things. And thank goodness I didn't have surgery. I didn't have any sort of procedures, but what I started with was functional movement. Like, how do I move? How do I hold myself? How do I use yeah. my spine? Am I, and I relearned how to move, how to walk, how to squat. Everything was off today, Tim, I have no pain. I couldn't, I, I, I could look the same MRI and I'm sure it hasn't changed a whole lot. 
on imaging, but I right. don't have back pain any day of my life. I don't. And <laughs> right. I'm 15 years later, right? But that's the power of, of decreasing inflammation, looking at root cause. And I think I'm saying that because I bet you have a lot of people who bring in their MRIs and they've been told, oh, you need surgery or you need some sort of very significant intervention. And like you talked about with the hip labrum, when you're looking at this from more of a functional perspective, regenerative perspective, how often do the images correlate and why is ultrasound a better tool sometimes for us to look at? Mm -hmm. Right. Wow. That's a great story. I mean, what a, yeah, I mean, you nailed it. Your explanation of the MRI was very good, by the way. So yeah, give yourself credit. You nailed that. <laughs> and then, um, and yeah, and then I think your point about your MRI is only going to be worse, actually. Right. Like, yeah. 15 years on, it's only going to be worse. So it's like, yeah, if you if you rely on the MRI to quote unquote, you know, let's see what's going on in there, right? That's yeah. the lingo that is used around MRI. Let's get an MRI. We'll see what's going on in there. And then we'll make some decisions based on that. And I used to buy into that. And I mm -hmm. used to say those words. Yeah. And I absolutely do not any longer. And most thoughtful orthopedic surgeons that I talk to now almost consider MRI like a tool of the devil. They don't really like it all that much unless they're just looking to get surgery from it. Right. Because there's so much nuance that has to be discussed in light of that imaging, right? It's data. Yeah. It's not information. It's just data. Yeah. And there's a big difference between the two, right? So data is just another piece of that. And then information is when you put that in the central processor and it has to meet up and, and it has to correlate with other things like physical examination and history yeah. and the rest of the picture. Like, is this a healthy person? Is it not? So, yeah, I think the question about ultrasound is a, is a good one too. Almost like the MRI though, I have patients come in and they're expecting me to ultrasound their entirety of their low back and uh -huh. tell them what's wrong. Right, right. <laughs> and I have to just dispel that myth. I'm just, yeah. I'm so sorry if that was your expectation, but that's not how we do things around here. You know, I'm going to do a physical exam and listen to what you tell me. And then those two things are going to point me in a direction. And then once we have a pretty good idea of what we think is going on, we might use the ultrasound to confirm yeah. that but i have to tell you even a still image of an ultrasound although it does have like greater specific like it's more um it's got like it's a, i'm sorry maybe dynamic because you're actually seeing movement in real time or yeah so there's so there's two things it it, it is it does have a higher sense of, like a higher sensitivity than mri like you can okay. see things more clearly oh wow um, so maybe the word i'm looking for is like on a tv that has yeah you know, more pixels or something like Got that, it. right? It's like, it's more detailed. That's number one. And then number two, yes, there's dynamics about it. So you can compress the transducer. You can add, ask them to move their arm, to squeeze their muscle and see things move. But what's the best, Jill, is not either of those. What's the best, and this sounds crazy to my patients, is if I can get a needle in there and I can inject into that tissue, I can see the tear kind of opening up before my eyes. And if it's in an Achilles tendon or in a rotator cuff tendon, oftentimes when you're scanning, just looking directly, you don't see it actually. Wow. You cannot see the tear because the collagen fibers are all aligned and they've, mm -hmm. and they've compacted on one another. But when you have the hydrostatic pressure of the fluid of the numbing agent yeah. injecting in, you'll see a little opening in the tendon for a moment while you have pressure uh -huh. on the plunger. And then when you let go, it closes again. Wow. So it's like peekaboo lesions. Yeah. And you can find those anywhere, really. Like, so inside of an Achilles tendon, a rotator cuff tendon, but more importantly is in these unusual places like myofascial injuries, for example. Yeah. My my lovely medical assistant today was talking about her shoulder blade is like grinding on her ribs when she tries mm -hmm. to lift overhead or do reverse flies, right? Mm -hmm. And she's trying to exercise her back and stay fit, but she's getting all this crunching of her shoulder blade on her ribs. And what we're able to now assess is that she has an injury where or a couple different muscles come together and meet with a fascia, piece of fascia between them. Uh -huh. And with the ultrasound, then you can look and get a sense that, yeah, maybe there's some injury there. But then when you inject, then the tears open up. Wow. And, and then immediately after that injection, when you take away that pain generator, her strength of her shoulder totally improved. And we did the same thing for her low back. So like, I guess my point is, is that it's, it's a lot more than just an ultrasound or an MRI. It really has a lot more to do with ways of thinking, yes. ways of examining, yeah. ways of beginning to interpret reality better than we used to be able to do so without opening up the body. And that's yeah. the beauty of ultrasound really is that 
you can you can find these things real time with an ultrasound and a needle if you can get it accurately to the tissue. And then you can reassess patients immediately and then determine, okay, that makes you look strong and functional. So that's what we need to treat. Wow. It's like the, I mean, problem solving at its best, right? Like we, we talked about this too, like, um, and that may be our engineering background. Yep. It's like the pattern recognition of like these things. And over time that experience then leads to, and sometimes there's this intuitive sense, or at least for me, it's like sometimes even God gives us wisdom, right? We've talked about oh, that yeah. too. Like, I don't know how I knew that, but that was, I love that though. Cause you're bringing, um, to light your clinical experience over these years. And then really, to me, I feel like you're on the cutting edge of discovering even new ways to think about and do things, which mm-hmm. our next generation of physicians need. That's exciting. Yes. Yeah, it's it makes me super passionate about working with the medical students at RVU. They I get to work uh-huh. with their students. We're doing research projects together, as you mentioned in the intro. And uh, a few of them come up and rotate with me and they get to see what we're doing and they get excited um, so I think they like being able to see things that are done differently, that are like thinking in a new way right. and thinking deeper, but it's not just like, it takes time to think and it takes time to do these kinds of, um, examinations. Yeah. So for example, Jill, back when, when I first opened the clinic six years ago, I worked, it's breakthrough regenerative orthopedics mm-hmm. in Boulder. And when we started, uh, six years ago, my, uh, my new appointment times were 60 minutes and my follow-ups were 30 minutes. And I thought I was really, you know, putting it out there, you know? Yeah. And then, and then I met up with a couple of other, my colleagues from around the country and one of them had three hour initial visits. And I thought, well, wow. gosh, he's, he's really inefficient, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but I kind of judged that a little bit, uh-huh. but, but he is a genius. And much of what I do, his name is Bradley Fullerton uh-huh. and he's out of te- uh, Austin, Texas. And um, he really is an incredible innovator in the physical examination in thinking about fascia and how muscles right. integrate with fascia and how we're one big tensegrity system. And when there's breakdowns in the hole, then it shows up at weaknesses and they can have far reaching effects. Yeah. So in any case, um, yeah, I, what I'm now doing is 90 minute new evaluations. Wow. So I've kind of been humbled and I had to, had to take a little bit more time because I was running out of time trying to explain what I was finding to yeah. my patients. Yeah, because part of what your role is, is teaching too, not only the medical students, but the patients, right? One of the things I thought earlier that I think is such a big thing that we need to teach is so many um, patients have seen an MRI with an orthopedic surgeon or someone who's really caused fear. And then Mm -hmm. they're stuck, that image is stuck in their mind, right? And that can actually like, I think, create illness where there maybe wasn't because they fear this image that told them that they had this injury that's uncurable or whatever. Um, how often are you explaining to patients, you know, the limitations of imaging and taking away some of that fear that's maybe mm-hmm. been created by other medical providers? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's such a good point, Jill. I mean, just yesterday I had to do it twice. Yeah. So um, yesterday was my intake day and follow-up day for new patients. And today was procedure day. So today was more fun. Yeah. But mm-hmm. um, but yeah, yesterday I had two patients like that exactly and um, very focused on the MRI images of their lumbar spine, just exactly mm-hmm. what you described. Yeah. And they had they had had surgery for a herniated disc um, and they had some persistent ongoing symptoms. And one of them was just certain it was the disc. And it and it was quite an educational process for me to show her like three or four different ways through physical examination that, look, I'm really not concerned about your disc. You know, it's, I know that's on the MRI, uh-huh. but your surgery worked, you know, I was yeah. like kind of validating the surgeon did a good job. Yes. And, and after having surgery on a disc, the surgeon rightly doesn't want to do another one right. because then you start getting into scar tissue, mm-hmm. further issues around the and nerves. immobility that then creates the whole chain of, um, right. I want to go back to fascia too. Cause I think like for me, that's the biggest aha and I'm not an expert, mm-hmm. but I want, maybe you can tell our listeners, like how much fascial training do we get in medical school? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, that's just the, that's just the glistening stuff you have to cut through to get to the tissues you want to look at in the cadaver. Right. It's that's kind of like the it. appendix and the thymus and these things that aren't like why would God ever give us any of these things that we don't need, like fascia? <laughs> um, it's yeah, really. Crazy. They just don't. They this historically it has been completely disregarded. Yeah. Right. It's like if you look at anatomy textbooks, um, it's sort of just the thing you have to get through to get to the muscle. Right. Yeah, dissection. Exactly. <laughs> and then the muscle is the, the empowering agent that moves the limb. Yeah. But it, and then the nerve is what takes the message from the brain to the muscle. Mm-hmm. But yeah. so in both of those cases, the butt is that 
No, fascia is actually structurally super important. And many muscles in the body take their origin from fascia, not from bone. Yeah. And so that's number one. And then number two, when it comes to messaging within your body, there is no system that's as fast as the fascia. And they, by the way, they have little like myocytes in them, little muscle cells within the fascia, and they can become chronically tensioned uh -huh. as in an effort usually to stabilize a segment that is unstable. But for example, when you are walking down the, the sidewalk and it's wintertime, it's a little icy and you don't see that little piece of ice and you slip. Yeah your foot slips, but then you kind of do the correction really fast. That yeah. doesn't get to your brain. That's just fascia actually. Wow. And your reflexes communicating through your muscles and your fascia that fast. Uh -huh. it, it's the, the brain can't get involved in that. It's just too slow. Yeah. So that's really your fascial system riding the ship, if you will. And so that's why you need to keep moving and you need uh -huh. to keep it breathing and you need to keep it well vascularized, you know, blood flow in blood flow out. And you don't want to get too tight, but you don't want to get too loose. So <laughs> We've uh, like Bradley Fullerton in Austin, mm -hmm. Texas, he's, he's been the big, biggest advocate of we need to tighten up the loose injured fascia. Right. And then myself and then, um, mm -hmm. and then Philip Steele out of Helena, Montana, we've been, we come, we're like bringing up the, we need to free up the fascia much more yeah. like the body workers do. When we're doing fascial release, right? Yes. We can do that with fluid on a needle. Like we do around our nerves. We can do it with the fascia to free up a tissue plane desensitize the nerves that are in that tissue plane that might be stuck in that tight fascia and get more glide and more motion and decrease pain. But it's really true that in some cases you want to tighten in some case you want to loosen, right? So like Brad's right, we're right. It's just, you have to be able to learn and discern of uh, who's right when and in which situation. And so we've had a tug of war over the last five or six years and we've kind of teamed up. We call ourselves the meeting of the minds and we get together once a year wow. and we evaluate patients over a weekend and uh -huh. we take like two hours with the patients and all three of us get to light, lay hands on and scan and ask questions and do physical and we teach each other and we all get better. And, um, and wow. so, yeah, so for our patients who get those two hour sessions, it's a real gift. That is so fascinating. I've learned just cause I have a massage therapist who's really into fascial work and then a physical therapist who does counter strain and strain and, and that kind of thing work. And again, both of them have taught me the power. And it's interesting cause I'm on the spectrum of mass cell activation and Ehlers-Danlos types of patients, which are the mm -hmm. ones that are super mobile. And I see all kinds of cervical, I mean, you name it, it can be very severe symptoms when things aren't holding up your brain, for example, mm -hmm. <laughs> the cervical. Yep. It's fine. Again, I'm sure you deal with that. Well, let's talk a little bit about, I want to sh have you share a couple, maybe uh, examples of patients and like the kinds of people. So if people are listening out there and like, well, could this be helpful for me? What are some of the common things or some of the kind of really cool cases you've seen? Do you want to share one or two of those? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. sure. So just in general, I think when you think of regenerative medicine, I think for the listeners and for the physicians um, that are listening, yeah. the main two areas that have proven benefit are in chronic tendinopathy with with interstitial tears. So the most best studied are lateral epicondyle, so tennis elbow. Um, I would say gluteal tendinopathy has amazing data. There's there's uh, some evidence around Achilles tendon and around rotator cuff, but it's not as good. Um, patellar tendon, it's kind of mixed messages. I can poke holes in most of the studies that are negative, Jill. Uh -huh. Um, you have to be able to read these critically and, and I don't want to get too political about the whole thing, but I'll tell you this, that the, the articles that end up in JAMA are the ones where it's always negative. It doesn't uh -huh. help. <laughs> so it. totally they want it, they want it to be uh, pharmaceutical or surgical. Yes, yeah, Same as fish oil or uh, CoQ10 or you name it, anything that might be helpful. It's the mm. negative ones that get published in the large yeah. journals. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and what's the craziest thing is that like the, the top two, I think of in orthopedics are glucosamine chondroitin for osteoarthritis. Yeah. And then I think of PRP for Achilles tendonitis. Those are two big ones that were published and in both cases, what's the, the craziest thing is like both groups, the control group and the treatment group did amazing. The, the conclusions that are drawn are really right. bizarre, actually. The conclusion in both of those studies should have been like, wow, why was the placebo so effective? Right. And look, this other stuff's really effective, too. Uh -huh. But instead it was, oh, it didn't separate from placebo. Yeah. Uh, must yeah. not be very good. And, and the way they set it up was in both cases was just kind of, uh, yeah, it was like they were intending for it to not yes. to be able to, to show no difference, but that's my small political statement, but the, um, but tendinopathy and then osteoarthritis. So knee osteoarthritis, I will tell you this there, I think if not 11 for sure, maybe 12 meta-analyses. So a study of studies have been completed 
It's usually one a year because those are easy studies to do. And people just add on the next one or two studies that have been published since the last year. And then they get their name published on something. But what they do is they say, well, what's the best injection for knee arthritis? And they compare PRP to hyaluronic acid, to steroids, to maybe prolotherapy or saline, something like that. And then year in, year out, the meta-analysis concludes the same thing. PRP is the best thing that we have for knee arthritis at this point in time. Uh, it's at least 11, if not 12 now. Wow. Meta-analyses. And usually one mm -hmm. meta-analysis that's in favor of a thing is enough to change the standard mm -hmm. of care. So if we have uh, studies that have been done that's changed the standard of care to the 12th power, like mm -hmm. there is maybe nothing we have in medicine that's as well proven, mm -hmm. but insurance will not pay for it. And I think there's reasons why that have to do with kind of, you know, dividing up the medical pot of pie uh, uh -huh. from, from a pot of money in the medical pie, um, you know, device makers and operating rooms need to run and all the rest of it. So um, in any case, I don't think those are probably ever going to be paid for, unfortunately, because of yeah. that. And then so tendinopathy and knee arthritis are the top two. And then, of course, you could do ligament laxity. Uh -huh. So people are chronically spraining their ankles. Yeah. Uh, or an MCL strain of the knee. Uh, those, would be, those would be good examples of ligaments that are easily treated with regenerative medicine. Now, the more interesting cases for me are just keep getting more and more interesting the longer I practice. They, I'm getting more and more complex patients. Yeah. And I think that's because that's part of the deal. You know, as we, as we grow in our ability to help people, we get more challenging things coming our way. And um, so sacroiliac ligament laxity has been a focus of mine for a number of years now. And I, I was fine with treating it. It was just sort of uh, something that people were missing. I'd, I'd learned from some prolotherapists. It was really helpful for people with chronic hip pain, low back pain, and sometimes leg and knee pain. But then I met Kristen in, I think it was the first year I was open in Boulder in 2018. And that was the case that kind of changed the course of my career, if you will. And now I really have a lot of energy around SI ligamentous laxity, learning how to diagnose it, how to treat it, and then teaching about it. And I think it's one of the biggest holes in orthopedic medicine that's just not been understood. Mm -hmm. And people end up blaming this like posterior hip pain, sometimes anterior hip pain, even in low back pain on either spine mm -hmm. or hip, right? So they go to the spine surgeon, they get an MRI. Sometimes it'll show some things. Sometimes it doesn't. And they're like, well, if it must be your hip, they go to the hip surgeon, they say, well, you got a little labral tear, but it doesn't really quite meet the criteria. It seems like it's posterior hip pain. It should be in the front. Probably should talk to the spine guy. And then mm -hmm. they get an epidural steroid injection and they get radiofrequency ablations and they see yeah. the pain management person and they inject their piriformis and everyone's blaming the piriformis. But what's not really well understood, there's anatomy around the SI ligament that's really important. And this has been my discovery. That is that between the ilium and the sacrum, you have the SI ligament and it stabilizes that hemipelvis. And then you have it on the other side too, and the pubic symphysis in the front. And if one of those is unstable relative to the other, you have asymmetry in your pelvis uh -huh. and then you're always gonna have rotations. I mean, yes. always. And, um, and the other problem that I noticed and I couldn't quite explain was that every time I found SI dysfunction is what I called it at the time, they always have glute weakness. When I do sideline glute meat yeah. assessments, they, they couldn't hold their leg up and like, what's that about? You know, like, why can't they activate their glutes? So I dug through the literature, kind of watched, I watched your movie, by the way, thank you so much for inviting me to watch that. That was fascinating. But every time you got yourself a, a new diagnosis, you just dug in. And I love uh -huh. that about your <laughs> curiosity and your persistence. And I have the same way when I have a problem I can't solve. It's like, okay, I need to figure this out. And yeah. so I, I've dug through so much literature, but essentially what I've come to realize is that the glute med, the posterior gluteus medius, which is one of the most important hip muscles, most important muscles in our body for staying upright and on our feet and being able to walk, um, attaches to the SI ligament. And this has not been published. And this is something I'm in the process of publishing. I'm doing uh -huh. research to make this known um, on cadavers. And then there's a physical exam. You can test for SI ligamentous laxity by just uh, it's from Diane Lee. She's a physical therapist. She taught at my conference. And I think the smartest PT maybe in the world, maybe the, maybe the best critical thinker, like on physical examination in the world I've ever met. And she created this physical exam working with Andre Vleeming, uh -huh. who was a, a leader in the concept of SI ligament laxity back in early nineties, 92, I believe it was. And it's just gone completely untaught wow. except for the people that go to work with Diane. 
Yeah. And fortunately, she has a woman in town named Don Sandalchidi, a great PT friend of mine, lovely human, just retired. Way to go, Don. And um, Don came up and taught me the examination after learning it from Diane. And Kristen, the patient I'm going to tell you about, she had a really bad case of SI ligamentous laxity. And I was prepared for that because of Diane and Don. And wow. um, Kristen is also a physical therapist and she's a lovely human, one of the nicest people I know. And, but it was the first day I'd ever met her and she was going to tell me her story. I said, Hey, you're a PT. Just give me the quick story. I really want to do my physical exam because I only yeah. had 60 minutes at the time. Mm -hmm. She's like, I can do it in 10 minutes. No problem. I'm like, great. 45 minutes later, after she finished her story, you know what she concluded with? She says, Tim, I just feel like since I've had my pregnancies and I had my babies, yeah. My SI ligaments got stretched out and they just never recovered. Uh -huh. And she was absolutely right. Wow. And we, and we, and I cried. I mean, we both, we just broke down in tears because it was just so sad that this physical therapist who had worked in our system for six years was trying to find help from the spine surgeon, from the hip right. surgeon, from the pain, epidurals, the whole thing, and just couldn't get help and was out of work for, a, for four oh. of those six years. She had to quit work. She couldn't sit for 20 minutes to go out and have coffee with a girlfriend. Wow. And so it was affecting her social life. It was affecting her professional life. Obviously her marriage, she couldn't drive up to the mountains with her kids to go skiing. She couldn't ski. Yeah. You know, that was the last thing she was going to do. And so we got her treated and, you know, and within about a year, she was back to doing most of the things that she wanted to do, but she was the lead off speaker at my conference. And she presented uh -huh. the case of a woman with SI instability. Then people did not know it was uh -huh. her. <laughs> And so when they got the big reveal, when she says, and I can tell you that this patient met their long-term goals of being able to sit for eight to 12 hours to drive their kid to college, whew, oh. <laughs> there was, this was yeah. not dry. There was not right. a dry eye in the place. <laughs> it was just fast. Just, it was fantastic. Oh. Yeah. And so, so that was a really great case where um, she's back to work. She's now teaching others. You know, she was teaching at my conference. It was just so neat to see her full circle. And then, um, I mean, there's others that are like that, right? I mean, I could go on. But the most recent discovery, I think, that we put together at this conference is um, Don, who I told you about, the PT in town, and my buddy Phil from Helena, Montana, they yeah. got together. He, she flew up to Montana, uh -huh. and they worked on a couple of patients and figured out that also the lumbar multifidus um, actually inserts onto the SI ligament, too. That's kind of the new discovery. So we have wow. the multifidus and the glute med meeting at the SI ligament. And so now I'm not just treating the glute meat in the SI, I'm also treating the multifidus. And I think that's the next frontier to really just change people's wow. lives for the better again. So it's fun. That's so fascinating. So in this area with SI is, is the symptom again, forgive me for my ignorance, because this is your area of expertise mm -hmm. and not mine, but would they mostly complain of inability to sit without pain or inability to squat or what would be like a physical manifestation of these SI issues for someone and uh, just like day to day, yeah. what would they tell you? Well, there's a, there's a few different ones. So there, it depends on, as Diane Lee would say, yeah. meaningful task. So for some people, it's the ability to walk and uh -huh. to, to ambulate. Yeah. <clears throat> for others, it is to sit and for others, it's to lay down. Okay. Most commonly is sitting difficulty. Sitting okay. tolerance is the mm -hmm. limitation uh, that I see the most. And then walking tolerance is number two. Wow. And yeah, it's usually manifest as pain in the butt. Mm -hmm. uh, a posterior gluteal region that um, oftentimes will affect their low back is, and wrap around to the front of their hip too, because remember, they're going to have that rotation. Yes. And so yeah. they're effectively getting like a, a femoral acetabular impingement in the front uh -huh. of their hip when their hip is rotated like that way. If it's rotated the opposite, if it's mm -hmm. rotated back, if this is the cup, this is, this is the mm -hmm. ball. Um, and it's rotated back, now it's functionally like a dysplastic hip that's uncovered. Yeah. And the labrum is at risk for it in a different way. Okay. So in both cases, the labrum is at risk. And so they oftentimes have anterior hip pain. Yeah. And then their other muscles are now all in spasm, trying right. to stabilize the pelvis. Exactly, because they're trying to, oh, fascinating. Yeah, so I'll so, come to that. Um, one thing I want to be sure and talk about before we let you go is your conference. And just mm -hmm. like uh, tell us the title, because I love the name of the conference. And then how did this come about? Because I think this is the next level of what you're doing in the world. And I'm so excited to share. Yeah, for sure. So um, it's called the Collaborative Care Collective. And that is our website, collaborativecarecollective.com. And we call ourselves C3. Love We've it. had our first annual summit. That's all we're really starting with. But we'll probably eventually do things like this, you know, do some educationals and do some webinars and whatnot. But um, 
the way that it started was I was, I guess you'll just say I was given a calling, right? Mm -hmm. It was one of those days I'd probably been fixing people's SI ligaments for three or four years and just seeing life after life changed. And I'm just, and I was overwhelmed by one, like, this is so sad that it's just me who's doing this and maybe my two buddies, you know, uh, right. <laughs> and like maybe two or three of us that I, and there's a few others that do it around the country, no doubt. And, and they do it a little bit differently, but um, yeah, it just was weighing upon me, this Kristen situation. Right. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, it's not good enough. It feels like it's just not good enough that for me to go to the grave, knowing this, <laughs> having discovered these things. Yeah. And so I think that was the call that was placed upon me. It was like, you need to make this knowable to other people. And so that's when I started doing the research, right? Because okay. like, okay, first I need to establish that the anatomy is real. Yes. And then I have to establish that there's a physical exam that can be done and it's valid. And then, and then I will be able to publish data that shows that when I treat this, I, yeah. you know, people are doing way, way better. So it was kind of that constellation of those three things. And um, so what did I do? Well, what I realized was that Kristen's case, and I have another woman, Kathleen, who was the, the closing speaker at my conference, was another case of terrible SI instability. What was common in both cases to their success was that it wasn't good enough for either of them to have just met me. They had to have also had a really talented lumbopelvic physical therapist on their team and and also somebody who was good at like fascia work, right? So like myofascial release or visceral fascial yes. release or something like this. So in both cases, one of the gals had three of us on the team and the other had four on her team. Wow. And so what I realized is that we had developed a collaborative care team and we were texting each other and the patient didn't have to communicate all the messages back and forth. Mm -hmm. Like we were friends. And we were, it kept the patient at the center of our care team yeah. and we didn't make them come and interpret everything back and forth to us. We handled that so they could rest. And the goal was like, let their autonomic nervous system just calm down that somebody's got them, that feeling, you know? And so what we realized is that we had something special, what we were doing in Denver. And so then I reached out to a couple of them and I said, Hey, what do you think about, you know, would you be willing to consider and they loved the idea and they jumped at it. And then I got my physician colleagues from around the country, the guy from Austin and from Montana. Oh. And we put together a team and it took us about two years of meeting monthly to kind of figure out what are we going to talk about and how do we get this message across? And, and it was just beautiful, really. Uh, and, it, and the conference ended up being much more than just a medical conference. It was really it was more like a love in. <laughs> uh -huh. You're sharing great. the heart of it. I could just feel like that. Yeah. It's so, so important. Yeah, like everyone just loves each other. All of our all of our teammates on these collaborative care teams, we really just appreciate one another. Yeah. We all have the same heart for the patient. And and then the it seems that the people that we attracted had that similar kind of a heartbeat. So a lot of people, I can't tell you how many, but so many came up to me and they're just like, Thank you for following your calling. I feel like I found my medical home. Yeah. You know, because they none of us, none of the physicians in the group feel like we really have one group that addresses all the things we're trying to accomplish. And this is as close as we can get. And so that's what we're trying to accomplish is give people a home where we can learn to collaborate. And we were very strategic. We forced physicians and PTs and all and allied healthcare workers, like body workers to all sit at the same tables, Yes, present cases, and we'd make yeah. them talk to each other. Love it. And that was kind of intentional with the with the goal of like, guys, you need to start talking and like realizing that other people know that you don't because yes. the common theme was that had either of those gals who we presented at the conference only seen one of us, they wouldn't have gotten better. Yeah. Right. They, they really needed to be seen from three different points of view. And functional medicine falls right into that, Jill. And that's why I've sent you two patients since we chatted on Sunday. It's like my I've always believed in the importance of functional medicine and getting our patients healthy enough for their bodies to heal yeah. when I do whatever kind of treatment I'm going to do. Cause that's our underlying philosophy is the body can and does heal and under normal circumstances does so routinely, but in orthopedics, at least when something's out of whack, you know, if something's broken beyond repair, then we need to give it a little assist. And we just use the cells that, you know, are God given cells of platelets yeah. and stem cells. Uh -huh. That's how our body normally heals with platelet and stem cells. And then they facilitate all kinds of cellular communication that elicits a healing response. And so that's our underlying philosophy is that the body can and does heal. And we're going to facilitate that. Mm. And then our goal, really, I'd say at Breakthrough, the big thing is we want to get people back to doing the things they love to do with the people that they cherish. That's really our buzz line of like why we exist. And I can see it in your practice too, right? Like you're, you want to see people doing and thriving and, so anyways, I share that heartbeat with you and 
Oh, I know. I like, I loved getting to know you more and today even more deeply because it really is like so common. And I, I love your humility. And I, I hope I bring the same thing because I so much realize my limitations and how much that I rely on people like you and, and PT. And even in my office, we have, you know, massage and all these different things and everybody does their part and that collaborative care. I love that idea. And mm -hmm. I think um, the other thing that we share is like, God's given us these places where we can serve and help people, but unless we're teaching the next generation, um, it's all going to be in here. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I, I love that we connect on that level too. And I think it's so, so important for us to continue to teach the teachers and change the the way we do medicine, right? Really like that's, if you could go back, I'm thinking back to that surfer in California that had no <laughs> idea what God had in store. Right. What would you say to him or what would you like looking back at your younger self 20, 30 years ago? Mm. What words of advice would you say now that you're where you're at with this perspective? That is, no one's ever asked me that question. I have no idea what I'm going to say. <laughs> probably, I would, I would probably say, um, you know, let, like, number one, be gentle with yourself, right? Like, have self-compassion. And then, like, understand what it is. It means to love people well. Yeah. Oh, that's good. And I've got goosebumps because like at the core, you and I, mm -hmm. and hopefully anyone out there who's really, truly doing medicine in the right way, it's just loving people. Like it really, really is that simple. Granted, God's given us wisdom and all right. the other things, the skills, but truly like the heart of healing is that loving compassion, which you're doing with the conference you're doing every day. And Oh, Tim, thank you for the work that you do. Thank you for the joy and energy that you bring. And um, where can people find more about you and your clinic? Where's your website? Mm. So the medical clinic is uh, Breakthrough Regenerative Orthopedics. And um, I think it's BreakthroughOrtho.com is, uh, is that one. That's all kind of one big word. And then the conference is uh, the C3, the, but you have to type in Collaborative Care Collective because there's a few other C3s out there. Got it. Um, so collaborativecarecollective.com okay. would be those two things. So if you're out there and you're in physical therapy or fascial work or any of these areas, um, check out that conference. I really want to see that grow because mm -hmm. Tim, I think it's so critical. And I think more than ever, you know, with the pandemic, people felt isolated, but I think even practitioners and physicians we're all on our islands. And unless we, even you and I functional medicine and regenerative medicine, <laughs> I'm so right. excited about the collaboration because we, we all need one another. Well, thanks Absolutely. for the work that you're doing. Thanks for following the call to medicine and um, just really, really love the work you're doing. I hope all of you listening will go check this out. And then if you're in that, those fields that you'll check out the conference as well. Yeah. Well, thanks, Jill. Thank you so much. And, um, yeah, I look forward to more opportunities to work together. And I really do. I'll have to talk with my planning committee, but I hope we can get you maybe to come and say some words. It's right here in Denver. You don't have to travel. Makes it easy. And I would uh, love that. You can count me in. <laughs> <laughs> okay, excellent. Oh, to thank it. you.